Hello everyone. I'm so excited to announce my guest for the In Conversation series that is part of the Supply Chain Thought Leadership series for the Supply Chain Academy. I'd like to welcome Professor Martin Christopher, Emeritus Professor at Cranfield University. Martin has been at the forefront of developing new thinking and logistics and supply chain management. He led the Center for Transport and Logistics at Cranfield School of Management for over 30 years. His work has been an example for so many, both in academia and in industry. And I'm so excited to be uh, in conversation with Martin Christopher. So without further ado, Martin, welcome. What I want to start off with, Martin, is really you've had a fascinating journey, a fascinating life. You've been, um, you're published widely, uh, multi-award winning career. So why don't we start from the very beginning, Martin? Tell me, how did you, how did you come into logistics and supply chain management? Well, it was a long time ago. Um, and I guess it was almost by accident in a way, but um, uh, I actually went to uh, Bradford University in 1967 to do a master's degree following my undergraduate degree. And um, it was a very uh, early program in, in marketing. It, in the late 60s uh, in the UK, uh, marketing was, was a, a, a really a sort of off the radar thing. And this was, I think, one of Britain's first master's programs uh, in, in in marketing and uh, I um, I really got into this and uh, the the guy who was heading up the department my professor said um, do you want to stay on and do a PhD and I hadn't really sort of planned on that but I thought well why why not um, and round about that time we were running at Bradford um, a number of um, executive programs in fact Bradford was really quite innovative then and um, running short courses for managers, you know, 1969, that sort of time, um, was um, a, a pretty sort of uh, novel idea. And we had a, a, a director of short programs there who um, was really sort of um, on the ball. And he spent time, uh, particularly in the States, looking at what was hot, what was new. And he'd come across a couple of guys there who were um, talking about this thing called physical distribution management pdm uh, there were a couple of um uh, leading professors now sadly both um uh, dead um bud lalonde and, and don bowersox uh, two sort of uh, iconic names from the uh, uh, the early days of what we now call logistics and supply chain management uh, but this was an emerging area and um it really interested me because as I say, with my sort of interest in, in marketing, um, what was becoming very apparent, certainly at that time, um, was that marketing was still, you know, talking about, you know, if you've got a great product and it's about advertising, it's about promotion, and nobody was really thinking about the role of service and how we actually make products available and how we compete. Uh, in terms of being faster than our, our, our competitors. Nobody was talking about that sort of thing. Uh, distribution was seen as being a sort of um, uh, a cost. It was something that was um, uh, really not very sexy. Uh, most companies didn't really sort of put their best people uh, behind running the distribution systems. Um, but I was really getting very interested in all of this. And so around about 1969, uh, 70, we um, invited these um, uh, two uh, Americans over to uh, run a couple of conferences and short courses for us. And uh, that's when I got to know them and it began a long uh, relationship. And then in 1970, um, uh, another American, uh, Phil Sherry came over as a visiting professor uh, to Bradford. And I spent a lot of time working with him. We, we wrote a book together on, on customer service um, and this was the beginning of what we then call marketing logistics. It was this sort of interface between uh, what goes on in the marketplace and how we uh, seek to align our business processes with that sort of need to service the customer in, in a much more responsive sort of way. And 
I was very fortunate because at that time in Europe, nobody else was talking about this. Uh, there were no uh, university or business schools with courses on uh, logistics. Um, so at that very early time, and it was just good luck. It wasn't sort of, you know, me sort of having a crystal ball and saying, this is, you know, where you really want to spend time uh, developing. It was just being in the right place at the right time. And so I was able to... Um, establish um, at a fairly young age, because I wasn't that old then, we're talking 50 years ago now, <laughs> um, that, um, you know, here was somebody who was uh, doing something interesting in, in the area of uh, what then we call physical distribution management, as I say. Um, we moved down to um, Cranfield in 1972, and that's really, I think, when it really uh, took off, because um, Cranfield was then going through a, a period of fairly massive expansion. The business school was sort of um, being established for quite a long time, but was uh, starting to move now beyond the sort of narrow confines of the MBA, which is really where, you know, Cranfield was, was, was very focused then. Um, and that was, I think, the, the start of when we um, really began a significant, um, I'd say, investment in, in this whole area, which was now rapidly becoming logistics um, it still hadn't been called supply chain management because, as you know, that phrase, um, that label didn't actually emerge until, until the 80s. Um, but it was supply chain management. We were actually talking about, you know, collaborative working with, uh, procure, with, with suppliers. We were starting to talk about uh, strategic sourcing. Uh, and we didn't use phrases like end to end. But this was, I think, implicit in a lot of that sort of thinking. Um, again, much of the ideas were, were still coming out of the States at that time. Um, one of the early uh, influences in the 60s had been this professor at MIT, Jay Forrester, um, who had sort of launched this sort of whole area of um, systems dynamics. Um, he called it industrial dynamics, uh, in which he was looking at all the sort of potential uh, interdependencies and interactions in what we would now call a supply chain and, and how a lack of visibility, for example, um, would cause uh, this thing we now call the bullwhip effect, which uh, really should be called the Forrester effect. Um, MIT um, really invested significantly in this area. And of course, um, coming out of this, they developed this thing, which we now call the beer game, which is used in universities or versions of it, you know, pretty well around the world today, uh, highlighting the importance of taking this sort of total end-to-end uh, -end view. So, I mean, that's, that's basically how I, how I got into this. It was really by having the good fortune to uh, meet and work with some of the early uh, leaders, uh, particularly in, in the States, and then having the opportunity through Cranfield particularly um, to develop this into a, a sort of Europe-wide uh, focus. And what an amazing job you did with the with the Centre for Transport and Logistics at Cranfield. You had um, an established master's program which had waiting lists every year for young uh, graduates wanting to, to jump on a master's program in logistics and supply chain. But you also established um, the sort of, I guess, the alignment between your marketing academics and the logistics academics to develop, you know, the first demand chain management or the Center for Demand Chain mm -hmm. Management. Tell me a little bit about your, your thinking behind this, Martin. I know you alluded to it a little earlier. Yeah, well, I, again, as I say at Cranfield, um, I was working in the business school in, in, in the marketing and logistics group, as we called it then. Um, but interestingly, in, in a separate uh, faculty in the uh, university, um, we had a group of people who'd been around there for some time, working particularly in materials handling. We had a, a, a unit called the National Materials Handling Centre, which had been there since the, uh, the 60s, actually. Uh, very much focused on the technology of distribution. It was about warehouse design, a warehouse layout and, and, and materials handling technology within the warehouse. This was a period when the first automated warehouses were, were first starting to appear. Um, 
things we now take for granted. But, you know, uh, prior to all of this, most warehouses were, were totally manual in, in, every, in, every, in every respect. And they'd established separately from the business school, they'd established um, a, a master's a degree in what they called distribution technology, uh, uh, run by a then young uh, Alan Waller, who's still a, a visiting professor at, uh, at Cranfield. Um, uh, Alan, Alan moved on subsequently into consulting and um, also too, um, round about I think the sort of um, uh, late 70s, the university was going through a sort of a period of sort of uh, restructuring in a number of ways and it was decided to bring the uh, folks who were working in that distribution technology area into the business school and I was asked to sort of um, integrate that program with the work we were doing in, in logistics and so this was a sort of campus-wide um, focus if you like which was now being um, con concentrated synthesized in, into this one one group which we then call the, the center for logistics and, and supply chain um, and that's really where i think we, we we started to see the growth because um that master's program uh, developed from a very small beginning uh, into something like I think at the moment it's got 200 students uh, on it. Um, it's actually the biggest degree program in the university as it happens. Uh, but also too we're running a lot of um, executive programs um, and because I guess my interest was still very much about um, the marketplace and how we compete and how we can actually harness logistics and our supply arrangements to make us more competitive. Um, it seemed pretty logical to me that we should try and um, bring our marketing colleagues who taught the classic bits of marketing and our folks from the distribution technology area, bring them together. And this we call the demand chain management group, uh, which as you recall, you, you joined us as soon after that at uh, Cranfield um, and I think it was um, for me it was a pretty logical sort of um, coming together because you know marketing has long been focused around demand creation and logistics has been very much about the fulfillment of demand and so you know why keep these things separate um, and in, indeed if you look around the world and look at successful businesses most of them have got a very good um, connection between that sort of value proposition in the marketplace um, and how they develop processes to deliver that proposition. So they're not disconnected. Uh, they're very much you know, part and parcel of that same um, uh, business model. And I guess you know, this is why I, I started to use this idea that um, um, the world had moved on and we were no longer competing as individual businesses in a sort of standalone sort of sense. We were now part of a much wider network. And so uh, we started to talk about how supply chains compete, uh, not individual businesses. Uh, and that's still, I think, very much at the heart of uh, what our approach to logistics and supply chain management is, is about. And that's just, um, we could say, one of many of your uh, phrases that is uh, your most uh, recognized for, Martin that uh, individual companies don't compete, it's supply chains competing. And, um, you know, just talking about, you, you mentioned some very well-established companies who have a greater understanding of demand creation and demand fulfillment are not separate from each other. And also just thinking about how well-established the field of supply chain management is, as we said earlier, it was coined as a concept in the 80s, but you know, way before that, we've been managing logistics and supply chains and, and mm -hmm. so forth. So why do you think still many companies um, face so many challenges with actually managing their supply chains well? I think it's probably um, partly because there's a sort of historical sort of legacy of, of doing things in a certain way. I mean, you know, working in universities is a good example. You know, they've got established structures and they've got decision-making processes which go back a long, you know, take Oxford and Cambridge, I mean, they go back centuries. <laughs> um, 
And so, you know, getting things to change isn't easy. And I think this is part of the problem with organizations um, that they're traditionally organized on what I call a vertical basis. If you think about an organization chart for a company, um, you know, it starts at the top with the chief executive, it goes down layer by layer, it's, it's, it's vertical basically. Um, and our performance metrics um, reflect that. In fact, they encourage it. Um, so we have this sort of um, what we now call silo sort of mentality uh, based around functions, which are, are vertical structures. Our budgeting system, uh, again, cements this. So every year we have an annual process where we put together a marketing budget, um, an R&D budget, uh, a distribution budget, maybe, I don't know. And so everybody's now being met, measured against, are they achieving the budget, right? And it's all a vertical thing. Whereas when we talk about supply chain and we talk about connections and we talk about interdependencies and we talk about end-to-end, -end, that's horizontal, right? And we don't organize around those um, horizontal uh, sort of um, um, processes because in a sense we, that's what we when we talk about um, seeking to uh, create value in the marketplace and to deliver that value the, we do this through our processes and those processes typically cut across functions and so to manage them effectively requires uh, much more team-based sort of working it involves having metrics which reflect that sort of process performance, not functional performance. And very few organizations have been able to make that transition from the vertical to the horizontal. If you think about it, it's like moving through 90 degrees, you know, because currently we're pointing downwards. Now we want to point this way, all right? And making that change, this I think is, is the biggest barrier still that we face now. As you rightly point out, we've been talking about this for, for so long. You know, periodically, as you know, I try to clear out my office of all the old stuff I've accumulated. And that includes, you know, uh, PowerPoint. Well, they weren't PowerPoints then. They were overhead transparencies and, you know, and my lecture notes. And I look at this stuff and I think, well, actually, um, it's pretty much the same today. We're talking about the same issues. Um, yeah, there has been progress, obviously. There's been a lot of progress. And certainly, I think if you look at the newer companies, the companies that didn't exist 50 years ago, um, they had the benefit of starting with a clean sheet of paper. Um, and they could actually, you know, develop a business model that was capable of rapid response. I mean, the obvious examples, we talk about them all the time, but their companies like Zara, like Apple, uh, these, these weren't around 50 years ago. Um, and the companies that have had to sort of um, really struggle. And some have made that transition very successfully. I mean, you know, I think of companies like Procter & Gamble and Unilever, these are world leaders. Um, and they've been around a long time, but they've had to make a conscious effort to really um, focus on making that transformation. And it hasn't been an, an, an easy sort of process. Absolutely. And a really interesting point you're making there, Martin, about how you know, almost like the new kids on the block are, you know, they have the, the agility to be able to, uh, you know, develop their business models on a, on a you know, from a blank, uh, blank piece of paper. So they have um, the opportunity to learn from, well, not necessarily to mm -hmm. learn from um, legacy sort of leaderships, which have um, sort of made businesses complacent to change and to adapt and so forth. But one of the things we do know is that change is also now on the horizon. I think you and I met around, I think, 20 years ago when I was just coming out with my PhD thesis on supply chain risk management at a time when um, at Cranfield you were pioneering research along with uh, academics from MIT also that were looking at supply chain risk and resilience. So I kind of felt like I was in the right place at the right time. But even if we go back... Uh, at that time, we could say it was there were still periods of relative stability compared to what we what we experience now in in today's supply chains. So, would you say the same applies to you know the apples and the zaras of the world? Do you think they still have that 
the same agility to also deal with the changes that we're experiencing today? Or do you think, you know, there's a, there's a new shift that um, is required by supply chain professionals to really deal with the kind of challenges that we're witnessing around us? Well, I think certainly there's a, a well, obviously it's raised very much up the agenda this last 12 months, particularly as a result of, you know, the global uh, pandemic, um, which has made everybody aware of just how um, fragile a lot of our uh, supply chains are, particularly those which um, and many of them are globally uh, extended. And it's actually, uh, if one good thing is going to come out of this, it's the fact that there's a much greater awareness of the importance of, of, of supply chain uh, design and supply chain uh, management. Um, you know, politicians who once upon a time weren't in the slightest bit interested in anything to do with, you know, a supply chain uh, are now uh, desperately trying to sort of um, find ways in which they can uh, build um, or encourage, you know, more resilience to be created across um, uh, uh, not just um, uh, industry, but society generally, uh, be it health service provision or, or, or whatever. Um, so yes, I think um, these times are calling for radically new ways of, of, of thinking. And even before the pandemic, it was pretty apparent that we've moved into an era of, of turbulence and, and volatility. Uh, this has been, um, I think, a gradual trend since uh, probably the last 30 years. Um, as, as you know, with a colleague, um, uh, Matthias Holweg at uh, Oxford uh, uh, Business School, um, uh, he and I created this uh, volatility index. What we sought to do was to look at a whole number of supply chain indicators, you know, to do with things like uh, you know, the cost of materials, the cost of um, uh, fuel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, a whole number of different indicators, and we were looking at the changes in those uh, indicators, um, not whether they went up or they went down, but how frequently did they change? Uh, because that's really the issue. It's about you know things can go up, they can go down, but that's predictable. Um, it's when they keep changing, you know, unexpectedly, uh, that makes you know planning uh, pretty difficult. And of course. For centuries, most of our sort of business models have been based around the ability to make a forecast and to plan ahead. Um, and that's, you know, a lot, uh, informed a lot of our teaching. You know, we teach a lot about forecasting tools and we talk a lot about planning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, in this new world that we're talking about, and which, as I say, our, our sort of index indicated that round about the year 2000, we moved from a period of relative stability, okay, it wasn't totally flat, but it was relatively stable, into a much, much different world. And that, over those 20 years, um, shows no sign of going back to, you know, the good old days, so to speak, of predictability and, and stability. So what it's suggesting to me is that a lot of our supply chain thinking, as I say, was formulated in those, uh, the latter decades of the 20th century. And here we are now, 40 years on, 50 years on in some cases, um, where we need totally different sort of um, approaches and different sort of structures. Um, and Matthias and I um, decided to start thinking around something we call structural flexibility, uh, which was this notion that said that in the future, um, supply chains will need to be much more flexible. And that probably implies um, not having structures which are um, long-term arrangements, which are set in concrete, which are based around owning assets. Um, you know, well, if we wanted to change, it's, we can't change quickly. You know, I've, I've, I've invested millions in this sort of distribution uh, facilities, these factories, whatever. Um, and, you know, I'm stuck with what I've got. Whereas increasingly, I think what we're saying is, well, actually, um, what I really want to do is to be part of a sort of ecosystem, uh, very close partnerships with other players. Um, well, it's not for all time. These are often relatively short-term arrangements. Uh, but I want to be able to be 
capable of reconfiguring my supply chain arrangements rapidly as and when the circumstances change. And so this idea of structural flexibility is saying, well, um, what it's really all about is sort of making um, arrangements that give me the flexibility, the adaptability to be much more responsive. So I don't necessarily own this distribution center. I don't own that factory necessarily. Um, I'm much more of a sort of virtual uh, network now where we're connected through shared information, uh, where we're working in a very close level of partnership. Um, but it's a sort of, I say the phrase ecosystem, I think describes it uh, best. And it's one that's changing frequently. It changes as often as it needs to. So that I think is, is for the future, um, my sort of vision of, of, of where we're heading. And that's gonna require totally different sort of approaches. And particularly will require a much higher level of what we call supply chain orchestration. Um, being able to sort of connect and to sort of synchronize and to work across boundaries which extend from literally one end of the globe uh, to the other. And that's a really different sort of picture to the one we've been used to in the past. That's been really fascinating, Martin. And we've already seen that um, those companies that who, who have been more virtual and um, taken the principles of the sharing economies are the ones who've been able to survive the, the challenges and the impacts that they faced with this pandemic. Whereas uh, many in retail, we have seen, um, you know, the, the demise of a lot of the, the retail sector, particularly in the West, and uh, they could have done with uh, reading your paper on structural flexibility. So there's a lot of learnings uh, from there. Now, just thinking about, um, you know, sort of the ideas of Industry 4.0 and also the digitalization of our supply chains. Um, you talked a lot about like the ecosystem and it's changing and I'm completely in agreement there. Um, let's just think about the, the, the change for the future of the supply chain professional to finalize our, our discussion here. What, what is your vision of, of the supply chain professional in the future? Yeah, it's a very interesting uh, point you make there, Amira, because, um, you know, if I think back to those early days I was talking about, um, uh, much of the sort of focus, most of the focus was on uh, the mechanics, if you like, of um, inventory control. Um, we had, um, you know, models for determining uh, the ideal location for distribution centers. Um, it was all very mathematical in many ways, and, and many of those tools are still valid today, obviously, of course they are. Um, but I think with this sort of um, change in the focus away from the sort of, uh, you know, the, the trucks and the sheds, which is, you know, how traditionally uh, logistics has always been uh, seen, to a much more um, business-wide, as I say, um, it's interconnected system of of um, connect of organisations that have to be managed in a in a in a way which was quite different. You see, if we talk about managing supply relationships, you know, in in the past it was very much a sort of uh, well, I'm in the driving seat. You know, you do it this way, or or you or you don't do it at all. Um, working now in a in a in a context of partnership, that requires a different set of skills altogether. Um, and it's really very interesting to see how um, in procurement, for instance, our, our thinking has changed dramatically. Um, we're now encouraging um, a much more sort of, uh, what's the word I'm thinking, holistic way of, of, of seeking to manage uh, relationships. We talk about supplier relationship management. Uh, that, that concept didn't exist, you know, in the past. It was all about, you know, who, who can screw each other, basically. Um, it was now, I think, we've now moved into a, an era where we're much more focused on the softer skills, influencing skills. It's not just about supply management. This is true, you know, in, if we're trying to break down barriers inside the business, mm -hmm. just the same sort of principle. And I've always felt that a lot of our sort of uh, uh, teaching, a lot of the curriculum um, structure was 
based around what we might think of the, the left brain, which is very much about, um, as I say, the mechanical side of things. It's linear. It's about um, formulae. It's, it's all about logic and this, so, which is fine. We need, we need left brain thinkers. But increasingly, I think in this new world of uh, managing ecosystems and managing across boundaries, we need a lot more right brain thinking, which is about being able to see the big picture. It's about being able to see the interconnections and how we manage um, relationships. And so, you know, if you think about what would this imply for the, the, the sort of structure of a master's degree or any program in, in logistics and supply chain management, um, it's telling me that we need to focus more on you know the change management issues, um, on systems dynamics. Uh, you know, systems theory has got an awful lot to 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 offer, um, but also too, I think, um, on understanding the importance of um, um, interpersonal skills and the whole sort of cultural side of how businesses operate. So it's really quite different if you think about it. Uh, from the sort of degree programs you and I uh, went through once upon a time. Wow. Well, some very good advice there for all of those academics, all of those training programs that are looking at redesigning their curriculums, Martin. It's been fascinating talking to you, Martin. Thank you so much for your time today. I'm sure that the viewers and the listeners are really going to be fully engaged with what you're saying here. And finally, thank you so much for the contribution that you have made to the world of logistics and supply chain. You've been a great uh, mentor, a great inspiration for many, both in academia and in industry. So thank you, Martin. Thank you too. Thank you.